Welcome, everybody who is listening or watching. I appreciate you taking the time to do that whenever it is that this is for you and wherever you happen to be. Uh, this is another uh, conversation, interview that i am uh, been doing a series of uh, called Crossing the Boundary. And um, the basic theme of this is that uh, people have made major changes in their lives regarding perhaps their religious orientation or spiritual orientation, their politics, their um, sense of personal identity. And as part of that, they then are doing some really very important and good work in the world that I appreciate and want to support. So um, I want to also put in a little bit of a plug that if you do watch this and listen to this and appreciate it and maybe look at some of the other interviews, you can subscribe and the algorithm world will then help get more people to, to watch or listen. And that's the basic idea, to have the voices of, of people that are doing this good work out there. That's the reason I do it. So today, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to uh, be talking with John Malkin, and uh, we're going to see how this conversation evolves. Uh, John has interests in quite a few areas that, I, that overlap with things that I'm involved with. Uh, he's a journalist, a musician, an activist, a photographer, a filmmaker. His book, uh, Punk Revolution, an oral history of punk rock politics and activism, was his third book. He's also hosted a weekly radio program for the last 25 years in Santa Cruz, California, where he lives with his wife and son. His interviews and writings have been published internationally, and he's performed also as a pianist, percussionist internationally, and has collaborated with a variety of ensembles, dancers, choreographers for the last 30 years. Today we'll talk about uh, many of these things. I want to especially talk about his uh, experience at, with his radio program for 25 years, which he calls Transformation Highway. Also his book, Punk Revolution, an oral history of punk rock politics and activism, and his forthcoming book, Punk Spirit. Uh, so I've been aware of John for, for quite a while because he's a good friend of my son, Brent, where they met in Santa Cruz. And uh, so I've, I've been aware of, of some of his work and admired a lot of his work for, for quite a few years. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be with you today, John. Um, let me start by just asking you to, to share a little bit about where you come from. And if you would, and you could talk a little bit about uh, the ancestry that it goes back uh, where you come from, what, where, where the D, your DNA and uh, the transmissions of spirit or, or pain uh, have come to you. Thank you, Ellen. I was born in 1963 in Los Angeles, and my family was Jewish, and I was raised Jewish. We went to Temple Israel of Hollywood, and there was a period where I took the bus down Hollywood Boulevard every Wednesday to go to Hebrew school, and I had a bar mitzvah. Uh, I went to Israel when I was 16 years old, and we were there for nine weeks. I was on an Olpan tour with you know a group of hundreds of young Jewish people, and that experience was really life-changing for me in a lot of ways. Just being somewhere so completely different was mind-blowing mm -hmm. and put in me the desire to travel and explore the world generally. It was really interesting seeing people living quite differently. It was also mind-blowing having been raised Jewish 
and being told a certain amount of things about Israel and then going there and seeing a much broader view of what life was like there. What, what year was that that you were in Israel? I was there in 1979. Mm -hmm. And at that time, wherever our group traveled, we were accompanied by armed uh, military people. The kibbutz where we stayed, which was in the north of Israel, um, had metal shutters on the windows just in case a uh, bombing happened uh, or there was some sort of attack, which did not happen. But we were constantly aware of that kind of possibility. Um, when we traveled around Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, there were occasions where people came across a bag that didn't seem to belong to anyone. And the police were called and the military came over. And a bomb did go off in a place we had been. <clears throat> also, I remember being at the good fence is what it was called, the border between Israel and Lebanon. And we could hear bombing happening. And it was only... 20 years later that I discovered that that bombing was coming from the USS New Jersey. They were bombing Lebanon. The United States was bombing Lebanon. I guess part of, part of all of my experience in this travel and being raised Jewish and then going to Israel, um, it made me aware of war and this question, uh, some questions arose for me during this time period around violence and nonviolence. Are people inherently violent? Why is there so much war generally? Kind of a, a naive question of a teenager um, at that time where I was raised, my whole generation was raised hearing about World War II and the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, where six million Jews had been killed and many other people. And we were taught that that was the war to end all wars. Mm -hmm. And then I'm growing up and I'm seeing firsthand continued wars. And my lifetime has been full of wars and most of them the place where I live, the United States, has been directly involved in those wars. And roughly half of our energy and money and resources go in to developing things that blow up people. Mm -hmm. This, uh, later we can get into the punk rock thing, but that point is a major point in the punk rock revolution. Why is war happening? And let's stop it. Uh, what a waste. Um, Were your parents and or maybe your grandparents um, um, somewhat questioning also things like war and peace and justice and issues like that? Yes, to some extent. <clears throat> they were not radicals. They were liberal. Mm -hmm. um, and Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I remember discussions around, hey, if the war in Vietnam is still going on when you're old enough to be sent there, we'll send you to our family in Australia and you can escape going to that war. <clears throat> so I, the U.S. war in Vietnam ended in roughly 1975. And I graduated high school in 81. So it actually at the time felt kind of near, but it, it was five years, you know. Um, I, I often have thought I should have been alive during the 60s, during the hippie revolution, this time when people are creating peaceful communities and challenging militarism and capitalism. And I, I realized at some point, I was alive during this. I was alive during almost all of the 60s, but I was born in 1963. 
Um, right. You're born in the part of my my history is that I was adopted when I was born. And the adoption was arranged before I was born. My family I grew up with wanted uh, to adopt a child who had a Jewish background and a Jewish mother. Oh. They found a mother, um, her name was Barbara, who was pregnant and from New York and had moved to Los Angeles to have her baby, me. And so they had, they actually met each other, which was unusual at that time. They met before I was born. And when I was born, I went home to Bill and Bernice Malkin, my parents. Right. And a year and a half later, they had a daughter, my sister, Diana. And that was my family I grew up with. And my parents always told me that I was adopted. And they told me just little bits of information they knew. Uh, my mother was Jewish. My father was Italian. Um, they were from New York. Uh, and, and actually their genealogy, my, adopt, my birth family and my adoptive family have similar uh, genealogies in um, Russian, Polish, Jewish families. On your mother's side, on your biological mother's side, uh, on yeah, and not my not my bi biological father. Right. Yeah, he was Italian. Yeah, yes, that's, that's um, very interesting. I didn't know any of that about you, and uh, you know, uh, I wrote a book about uh, Jewish identity and people who evolved mm -hmm. to other spiritual traditions. That, um, so we we'll, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, did your so did your your parents? You said had a, had a kind of liberal democratic bent. Uh, they maybe were not that supportive of the Vietnam War. Um, do you feel like you inherited or took on some of the kind of attitudes about culture and and uh, politics and the world? from your parents rather than you had to kind of rebel against the way they were? Or how did that go? I think a mixed uh, taking on their attitudes and rebelling. Okay. They, I think they would for sure say that I became much more radical than mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never... <clears throat> I never heard them criticize capitalism or militarism in general terms. Mm -hmm. I think they were still part of a generation that thought there were good wars. Mm -hmm. And I have challenged that notion for a long time and then gone deeper into that, as I mentioned, um, learning things like nonviolent communication and, and teaching that and really hoping that human interaction can move beyond domination and control to cooperative methods. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, regarding Israel, I think my parents were among a, a large number of Jewish Americans who had a hard time criticizing the Israeli government and the Israeli military, which continues to this day, I mean, we all grew up, I, I can't believe how many films and books I was exposed to about the Holocaust. It almost became, I, I even as an adult, I had to force myself not to go to that section in the library. There are a lot of other things to explore in this world, some that are tragic and some that are beautiful, but things besides the Jewish Holocaust, um, and so that has shaped Judaism a lot, and fair enough, it it should. And one of my underlying questions is around how is it that these religions like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, that at their core they teach be kind, 
and compassionate to others, maybe even especially to other people who have chosen a different path. Mm -hmm. How does that turn into constant war? Mm -hmm. This is a curious thing. Um, so life is complicated and, and teachings on love become teachings on war somehow. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So my parents, I think, uh, I, I actually, they were quite surprised sometimes by my actions and attitudes, which went mm -hmm. much farther than where they were at. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to come back to that one uh, in a little bit. Um, but first, uh, I I know that uh, of your many interests, radio has has been a really big one. And you've used uh, the radio platform to do interviews, to promote certain kinds of music, politics, activism. Um, you've, you've also done a lot of publishing of written material. Um, but say, I, you you uh, initiated or were part of something called Pirate Radio, Radio Free Santa Cruz. Um, that was essentially an illegal, uh, technically illegal. I don't know if they ever prosecuted people for things like that or if you felt in danger. But talk a little bit about starting a pirate radio station and what that was for you. Yeah, thanks for asking about that. It's really a great part of my past and my path. Um, Free Radio Santa Cruz was started in 1995 by a small group of people. I was not part of it yet. It was started in a bedroom. And you can build a, a radio transmitter from a small amount of technology and have an antenna like a radio shot kind of yeah like, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there was a guy in berkeley stephen dunifer who was operating um a pirate station in berkeley and he offered help to anyone around the world who wanted to build their own uh pirate station so i was already involved in a lot of activism i had seen a man killed by Santa Cruz police. I witnessed this and filmed this actually in 1991. <clears throat> and I was involved in the anti-war protests when the Gulf War started at that time as well. I was part of a group called the Christic Action Team that was putting out information about Iran-Contra and CIA involvement in I lots of- that. I remember Christic, yeah. yeah the Christic Institute. Um, and when this radio station started, I sort of funneled my activism into that and continued organizing events and um, talking to people about all of these things, militarism, capitalism, and spirituality. Um, on my so I, I did my show at Free Radio Santa Cruz from 97 until about six or seven years ago. And then I started doing my show on KZSC, which is at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So that's an above ground uh, kind of the legal official radio station. What, why would you have, just for people who don't know anything about it, why would you have a pirate radio station? Why would one have that? It really fit with our ideals and our goals. Hmm. Fundamentally, like why ask permission from the US government to communicate with people? Uh -huh. And it was illegal and people did get arrested sometimes, not in Santa Cruz, but sometimes other places <clears throat> and we were served quite often uh, legal papers from the FCC. Mm -hmm. FCC agents would use these rudimentary um, devices to find us, mm -hmm. which was really easy to do. You you triangulate and come down and they would leave papers 
or us saying you have to stop broadcasting, this is illegal. Um, and in 2004, in the morning, uh, one of the DJs at Free Radio Santa Cruz left. She finished her show, closed up the, the station, and went outside and noticed there's a lot of SUVs with black tinted windows parked in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we were really organized, uh, luckily. And we had a phone tree set up. She called someone. They called two people. Everyone else called two people. And the there were about uh, a dozen heavily armed federal marshals and FCC agents with um, assault rifles and pistols. And they broke into the studio and stole our radio station. Mm -hmm. And it took them all day. They, they really unloaded our whole station into their SUVs. Mm -hmm. During that time, we contacted all the local media, uh, local city council people, and there were a hundred people at the station with signs and, mm -hmm. you know, communicating with these agents saying, what a waste of time. Mm -hmm. What is, why are you even doing this? And so they, they loaded up our station. Um, and at the end of the day, when they were ready to leave, I had not noticed that this was happening, uh, but someone had slashed all the tires of all their vehicles and they did leave with our radio station, but on the back of pickup trucks, on the back of uh, tow trucks. Um, Utah Phillips, who was this amazing hobo singer, anarchist, storyteller, activist, had become a friend of mine. I had interviewed him on free radio Santa Cruz. And I talked to him and he said, Hey, how can I help you guys after this raid happened? And he came down to Santa Cruz and did a concert, headlined a concert with a bunch of other people. And we raised enough money at that to last the next 10 years. I mean, pirate radio was pretty cheap. Reminds me, actually, we all, every DJ, was responsible for coming up with a small amount of money every month. I think it was $20 or something. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, we didn't want to ask for a permit from the U.S. government. We wanted to explore and use whatever kind of language we chose. Um, I did an interview with Howard Zinn on Free Radio Santa Cruz, and he joked you know, he said, wait a second, this is an illegal pirate station. I can't possibly do this interview. And he laughed uh -huh. uh, because it. I did. I viewed this experience as being a direct experiment in civil disobedience uh -huh. in not being obedient to the rules of the United States government yeah. in, in a small way. Yeah, uh, I actually have known a lot of people who have done much larger experiments in civil disobedience um like kathy kelly who i've interviewed quite a few times who for example organized 50 delegations to go to iraq right. when there was a u.s embargo on taking medicine and food there and she took medicine and food there she's part of a christian I would say she's not exactly part of the Catholic worker movement, but she's part of Christian groups who take Jesus's teachings mm -hmm. on anti-war and anti-militarism quite literally. Mm -hmm. um, and she and a, a lot of people I know have, they've known that when they do certain things, they will go to prison and they do them and then they go to prison. And of course, a lot of them then turn mm -hmm. some of their attention to wanting to abolish prisons because mm -hmm. uh, they've had now direct experience in prison. Um, so that's I part of the review. Let me kind of interject, interject a question here. So, you know, you, in a way you're, you're talking about some anarchist kinds of ideas like, and do you feel at all that your own thinking has evolved in the sense that 
Well, maybe the government does have a role in keeping airwaves uh, open so that enough of the channel is free and not interfering with each other, sort of the way they do with airplanes. You know, they, they you don't want airplanes to just fly wherever they want to fly. They're, they're crashing into each other. So um, I'm just wondering, and, and whether or not some people maybe should go to prison, you know, like, uh, so has, has that level of anarchy uh, evolved in your own thinking at all? Well, I consider these things regularly. I would, I still call myself an anarchist. And I, I do like to say, too, that I, I don't know if I'm a really successful anarchist, because I participate a lot in things that are not anarchy. But uh, yeah, I think I, I much prefer the idea of being self organized, not you, I don't think we want airline pilots who are not flying into each other just because they're told that's a rule or because at the moment it's safer to do that. The same with the radio station. We, we actually self-regulated in that there were points in time. We, the free radio Santa Cruz operated from 97 to 2000. 15 or something, there were a few times where radio stations were given our, our place on the dial. Can you believe it? Who are we going to complain to? We can't. Um, so we would have to change where we were on the dial. Um, we were not going to fight that or argue that. There's actually plenty of space on the dial. So we moved a couple of times there were moments where it was a little funny too, where you'd be driving around Santa Cruz and coming in and out um, of audibility was free radio Santa Cruz. And then this really right wing Christian station, um, which made for some entertaining radio for a month before we changed where we were. Um, I, I, a lot of anarchists are pretty clear um, we have to be very organized. It doesn't mean chaos, which is the popular equation that people are given for anarchy. Uh, I, I sometimes think, wow, I'm kind of grateful the US government is as disorganized as the rest of us or things would be even much worse. Um, in terms of the damage that they've done I, I, the specific examples you're bringing up, I, I like the idea of feeling safe in the world. I don't want planes crashing into each other. Um, but I would say in another way, like how this is, this is kind of a important question for me too. How do we expect to have a democratic culture where people are making choices about their lives and what happens in their lives. How do we expect adults to live in a democratic culture when their education they go through is not democratic? They don't have choice in what they do at school, how schooling happens, um, what things they learn about, what parts of what histories they learn about and ideas. Um, so I still, I still very much like the uh, realm of anarchism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's an ongoing conversation, isn't it? Like, what, where, where do we collectively make decisions, and where do we really want to emphasize that individuals have the freedom to do their creative work too? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I want to come to your book. Um, Punk, revo punk revolution, and I and I will say that you know uh, when I first heard about it, I said, "What is this guy doing with punk music?" I thought that was like for for like people who you know are violent and are doing meth methamphetamine all the time, or angel dust and banging their heads against each other. 
I mean, I have to say, I'm, I'm maybe stuck in the 60s and, and uh, or other genres of music that I appreciate, but I never had opened my eyes or ears to, to punk music until I started thinking about this interview with you and you forwarded me some suggested uh, musicians and so forth. And I looked at your book and, and I see that uh, <clears throat> it's, it's much a much bigger phenomenon than I had thought it was. It's international in scope. There, there are punk musicians that are Hasid, come from Hasidic uh, Jewish areas that, that are from Japan, that are Buddhists, that are vegans, that, and that many of them are involved in very constructive, uh, as, as I see it, progressive causes and uh, service uh, things like feeding people that in, and so forth in areas that need that. Um, so your book, you interviewed uh, something like 250 different punk mm -hmm. musicians um, and with the emphasis on their relevance to revolutionary causes or, or radical politics and so forth. Again, something that you really opened my eyes to the fact that that even was a thing. And mm -hmm. uh, so you, I also noticed that you, your family moved from LA in the 70s to Orange County. Now I lived actually for a few years with my, at that time, uh, very, very young children in Orange County and in, in the very early 70s. And I knew it to be like an extremely, was then at least a very, very arch conservative area culturally and politically. And um, so, did that have something to do with your choosing to get involved with punk music, your your life in Orange County? Yeah, it was a called? really How did you first get into it. Yeah. It was a really formative time. Actually, we moved from Los Angeles to Orange County, which is only 45 minutes. And I thought, I'm gonna stay connected to my world in Los Angeles, and I did not at all. Uh, we moved the summer that I went to Israel. So I left and I went to Israel for nine weeks and had this mind-blowing experience of being somewhere so different, walking around Jerusalem, the old city there with the cobblestone and narrow walkways and seeing the desert and all these experiences. And I came home to Huntington Beach, Orange County, which in a way moving to the beach sounded like we get to live in a vacation, right? Well, the beach was great, <clears throat> but the culture was not. And it was very white, very conservative, Republican. I had grown up having mostly Latino, Black, and Asian friends. I, I was a minority at my school, being white. Moving to Orange County, it was exactly the opposite. I think there were two Black kids at our school. <clears throat> and it happened to be when punk was really exploding, 1979. It had been around already since 74, 75. But... I started going to shows more than, and oddly, Orange County was really a birthplace for a couple of styles of punk rock, um, hardcore punk rock that started being much faster and angrier, and bands like Black Flag, TSOL, Social Distortion, um, and a bunch of these bands were from Orange County. And I I was so attracted to bands like The Clash and The Dead Kennedys and Gang of Four because they were really political. The Clash had this album called Sandinista. This album is named after a revolutionary Central American liberation movement. And this is a triple album that talks about the U.S. being involved in coups and 
uh, CIA involvement around the world. There's a song urging young people not to join the military, songs about police brutality. So I was really, I'm like- but Didn't you know, didn't Noam Chomsky write a, a something for them, for that album? I thought I saw he, that on your-, on your he, he wrote, actually, there was, there's a band called Bad Religion from Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And when the Gulf War started, what, what we now unfortunately have to call the first Gulf War, in 1991, when that started, Greg Graffin, uh, the singer with Bad Religion, he sent Noam Chomsky a, a blank cassette tape when we were all dealing with cassettes. And he said, hey, record a, a five minute piece of you speaking, telling us why this war is happening from your point of view. And that will be the B side to this anti-war song. Uh, and it, it's really lovely when I interviewed Noam Chomsky about this. Um, and, he, you know, here I am. I'm thinking, should I really waste a question with Noam Chomsky on punk rock? And I'm so glad that I did. And I've interviewed Noam Chomsky a, a few times, which is amazing to me because he's a real hero for me. Um, he told this beautiful story about making the B-side for this song for Bad Religion, where when it was complete, they sent him the 45 disc and he listened to it. And like you, he's he's listening to this and, and he's saying, I have no idea what this music is about. He asked the daughter, the 14 year old daughter of a friend of his to interpret this for him. And she explained, this is an anti-war song about the Gulf War. And of the other side is his talking about the war. I feel like, you know, my when rock and roll came around, my parents and their generation were like looking at it and saying, what, what is this? Is this music, you know? Um, but somehow I, some like they were I, wrong I, and we, we were, <laughs> I'm not sure about punk still in terms of the, some of the music, but uh, it seems like it, it does vary quite a bit. Not all punk is just what I think of as screaming and thrashing the guitar. No, and that's what, what was a little alarming and raised questions for me in Orange County. Um, Five years earlier in London, in, in 1975, in London and New York, there were bands that were called punk that were really different from each other. At CBGB's in New York, the Talking Heads, Blondie, Television, uh, the Ramones, and Suicide were all called punk rock. And Talking they were... Heads. It's punk. Yeah, uh, yes. So what, yeah. is punk? what is it? What is it? I know there's a spectrum, but what defines what's punk? I think in general, it was an attitude saying we're a little tired of rock and roll being so glorified and happening in coliseums and being controlled by corporations. And um getting a little boring with um, long guitar solos. So people, and and not paying attention to reality so much, getting a little lost in um, other realms. So people were bringing it back home uh, and making shorter songs, leaving out guitar solos. And this really important part of controlling what they were singing about, how it was sounding, and uh, starting their own record labels and managing their own tours. So that all of that was really important. And these bands were really diverse. Um, Jonathan Richman also in The Modern Lovers. Um, and then what happens, I, I see some really strong parallels with political movements and religious movements and music movements, the punk rock movement, which started off saying, really, you don't have to know even how to play your instrument. 
get on the stage. And a lot of people started doing that and playing like Iggy Pop sometimes played a vacuum cleaner on stage. So there was a freedom of creative self-expression and a fundamental problem that I've explored is how, how then by 1979 in Orange County, California, punk rock meant you had to look a certain way, you needed shaved head and you, your music had to be fast and furious and angry. And there were even gang fights at shows, people saying you're not punk or you're a hippie. So this notion of, hey, anyone can be punk shifted and became more a closed thing and then had to be reinvented. I think similarly with Christianity or Judaism, where people get codified and follow rules and end up hurting each other and even killing each other. And then you have to stop and say, wait a second, what, what were, what were the original ideas that we were going with? Mm -hmm. um, and in Orange County, I saw kids with swastikas um, mm -hmm. and I could not understand that. And I talked to a lot of people in my interviews about that phenomenon. The dead Kennedys even have a song about this um, and, and countered that phenomenon that was happening in punk rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it sounded like a little bit to me, like there was, uh, I think it was as early as something like 1969 that a group called the diggers. I don't know if you ever heard of them. They were, they were kind of like a, a, a kind of group within the hippie movement that was very political and, you know, kind of really deep, deeper than the sort of superficial kind of thing. And, and they had a march through Haight-Ashbury uh, announcing the death of hippie. And they had a coffin and everything, you know, because they just said, like, this, this has become like a, a mainstream phenomenon already. And we, we've got to let that, that part of it go. And uh, like you're saying, you, you know, any sort of originally creative, deep kind of entry into the culture, into the world, seems to very easily veer off course, course especially with uh, capitalist influences in, in this country. That happens very quickly. Um, I wanted to, to shift a little bit from the, the punk uh, unless there's something else you wanted to say about your book, the, the punk revolution book um, itself, that must have been quite interesting for you. I mean, I, you you seem to be able to make contact with and and draw in people, uh, some very famous people to, for interviews, um, and you were able to, you know, interview hundreds of uh, punk musicians. Um, was that a fun project for you, writing that book? And and did you feel like you learned something yourself? Yes, it has been hugely fun and stimulating and continues to be. I'm now editing the part two book called Punk Spirit, which focuses on punk and spirituality, which those themes really were the grounding for this whole punk rock project but my book ended up so long I cut it into three parts and the first one as you mentioned is on punk rock politics and activism and it's just completely interesting and exciting to contact someone and say hey in these songs it sounds like you're saying this or uh, someone like Greg Graffin who's the lead singer of a very successful band uh, called Bad Religion, and they are very anti-religion. Um, he is a professor on the East Coast and teaches anthropology and evolutionary biology. Uh, so his, his music is filled with science and anti-religious stuff, really saying science has replaced religion as a method for knowing and being in the world. 
So people like Greg Graffin and um, John Lydon from the Sex Pistols and my favorite band, Gang of Four, talking to those band members, being able to dive into, wow, what did you really mean behind this? And what what were your hopes and visions for the world? How has music affected you? Do you think you've affected the world? Is is there less war? Are people more connected? Um, what about changing capitalism? What about abolishing police and prisons? So it's been completely amazing. I mean, there have been points where I've thought, I, I listen to other people's radio programs, uh, like Amy Goodman, uh, Democracy Now!, who I've interviewed at Free Radio Santa Cruz uh, long ago. And I, I look at the list of uh, people who helped produce the show. Like, sometimes I've thought that would be nice to have helpers yeah. doing some of this contact work. Like, I've contacted, and, and because of that, I've probably tried to get in touch with three or four times more people than I have managed to get in touch with. Uh, and still, it's a little incredible to me even that I've managed to interview 250 punk rock people. You're um, basically a, a one-man show for the most part. You don't, you don't have yeah. people, agents and people helping you out. And... No. I mean, what helps is when someone says, oh, you should also talk to this person. Here's their email address. Mm -hmm. uh, so that happens. Um, and right now, um, I've been doing some new interviews for the Punk Spirit book, mm -hmm. um, especially for a couple of chapters. There's a chapter on punk rock in East Berlin in the 1980s, where the Berlin Wall separated East Berlin from the rest of the world. And interestingly, the place that ended up accommodating and hosting punk rock people and revolutionary groups in opposition to the East German government were some of the people in some of the churches in East Berlin. And there's a church there called Zion's Kirch, and it's it was in East Berlin, and there were punk rock concerts there um, in the 80s that helped to lead to the revolution that brought down the wall mm -hmm. and ended communism in East Berlin, really. Mm -hmm. So I've been talking to punk rock people and church people there uh, who were part of this thing called the, the Kirche uh, von Unten, the church from below, is what they name themselves, kind of returning to more uh, social political aspects of Christianity. Um, so it's it's continually exciting and stimulating interviewing people. Um, and a lot of my interviews, I try to get published in magazines as well. Um, if they're timely, if someone is coming out with an album or a book. Uh, so I try to do that as well. And I've had a lot of them published in magazines internationally. You know, I've also interviewed so many people like punk rock is just one realm that I've been interested in. But um, people from all kinds of uh, music uh, genres like jazz and folk, I'm sure, as well, and so forth. Um, but I wanted to ask you about uh, your interest in spirituality and, and how that interfaces with uh, punk music as well. Um, what What is it that, that you think of when you think of spirituality? What is your own, do you, do you, if you have a practice, if you have like teachers that you've, um, worked with? One of the main things I always think of is meditation. And I think of spirituality as being the internal part of me. Although it's not completely that, 
because I think spirituality has to include the external world, uh, the things I'm talking about, like um, limiting suffering. I think spirituality has to do with suffering and limiting suffering in yourself and in the world and generating compassion, generating real understanding of the world as best as we can compassion and wisdom somewhere along the way i think i was about 12 years old uh, which would have been around um, 1975 my parents who i i said were not really hippies but were liberals um, took the family to learn transcendental meditation tm which the Beatles had kind of made popular through Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Sure. And it was being sold at that time as a way to make your life better, you know, do better at business, at school, uh, have better physical experience through TM. And wow, I really liked it. And I kind of didn't stop. I didn't meditate regularly as a 13, 14, 15 year old. But by the time I was 17, 18, I was, and I started reading more, especially Alan Watts, uh, The Wisdom of Insecurity was really important to me. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered Thich Nhat Hanh, who is really probably the most important teacher to me. Mm -hmm. And I was able to interview him in person a couple times, and his bringing together of meditation and being present, being mindful mm -hmm. and taking action in the world, both together. That's what I've tried to emulate as best as I can in my world. And uh, meditation continues to be really important to me. Buddhism became really important to me and uh judaism became less important um and i've done quite a few uh, meditation retreats in the vipassana tradition here in santa cruz i sat with a group called vipassana santa cruz for years and years and i still have a daily practice uh maybe every other day practice of uh, sitting for 45 minutes quietly and um, mm -hmm. kind of in the Thich Nhat Hanh Vipassana tradition. Mindful, so that's what's, yeah. Mindful breathing and so forth. A um, couple of things. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, I think this, I even might have seen this in your interview. He writes a lot about anger. He talks a lot about anger and what some people would call negative emotions and, and how we work with that. And, and one of the things he said, which is goes against, I think what some psychology oriented people would might say is that any expression of anger, even like to hit a pillow and do cathartic work, banging on walls or something like that, yelling and screaming to get it out of you is actually not a good thing, is not a productive way because you are in a sense energetically putting that anger out there into the collective consciousness. And I see you nodding and, and thumbs up and I agree with that. Uh, so is, isn't punk music almost always doing that? Yeah, this is such a good question. And in my book, Punk Revolution, there's a chapter called Anger is an Energy, be, uh, which is so hilarious because it it is exactly what you're asking. And I, I've asked this question that you just are asking me in 80% of my punk rock interviews. Um, Anger is an Energy is a line from a song that John Lydon sings. He was in the Sex Pistols and then later he started a band of Public Image Limited. And this song is very well known and he's singing, anger is an energy. And I realized at some point, wow, I'm listening to that song. And a month ago, I was at a retreat in San Diego with Thich Nhat Hanh. 
Thich Nhat Hanh is giving a teaching and he says, anger is an energy. Uh -huh. And so the question I pose to punk rock people is exactly what you pose to me. Do you think that yelling and screaming for 30 years has diminished your anger or not? Or in general terms, we, we are told if we yell and scream that it, it gets it out of you and it goes away. I'm hearing from teachers that by yelling and screaming, you're actually um, amplifying amplifying and and making your anger muscles stronger i i right now i tend to think it's not exactly one or the other i i lean towards Thich Nhat han and thinking i i prefer transforming my anger and not being angry but i think there should be let me put it this way. What a, a lot of punk rock people told me, wow, I it was actually very helpful to find a group of people who were angry about their parents or being told what to do or growing up in 1979 when we're being told, you know, uh, get a job, finish school. And by the way, there could be a nuclear war at any moment and we'll all die. Seriously. Okay without without a hint of sarcasm around that. Mm -hmm. So kind of nice to find a group of people where you can be energized. And I, I don't I don't think people at that time would say, I'm releasing energy. They would say, I'm feeling great. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't I don't think it's exactly black and white, but um I think it becomes a little not a little, it becomes a lot complicated also when you throw in guns into the equation where we now have more guns in the United States than people. And when there's a gun around and you wanna express your anger, um, it's becoming easier to do that. And that's not good. And we see, we we've all grown up seeing our role models, our leaders of government and our leaders in general who say, yeah, it's there's there's uh, a lot of good times to kill other people and shoot other people. So it shouldn't be surprising that people in the United States and now all over the world are shooting each other, too. It's a real problem. Yeah, the anger thing is a is a really huge question uh, for for all of us, I think. And I mean, it was a reason that I actually left activism for a good number of years because I realized, you know, that's all I was really doing was, you know, with the war in Vietnam and, and black power issues that I I was just adding to the anger, and I I turned inward for a while. But then I now feel like we can integrate spirituality and political action like you do. Um, but, but a couple of questions. Uh, where where are you now with what's going on in this country? And we've got an election coming up. I don't know if you've, you know, I know a lot of people are trying to navigate well. Do you support the Democratic Party, given all of what the Democratic Party does um, to stop Trump? Um, do you feel like you want to weigh in on that publicly? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, it's funny. It, there's um, especially around the Israeli war in Gaza that is almost now a year old. Like there's been periods where people are really reluctant to speak publicly and there's a lot of intensity around it. Maybe it's the same around the elections, the U.S. elections, too. One thing I just want to say, too, with what we were just talking about, in exploring anger and violence, I loved coming across Gandhi and I read as much Gandhi as I could during a period and I interviewed his grandson, Arun Gandhi. And I've interviewed so many people around nonviolence. 
this idea that Gandhi had that we need destruction of systems of violence and we need construction of new systems and maybe we need to spend a little more time on the construction than the destruction but i think punk rock embodies that destroy and construct thing pretty well in popular media what's completely focused on is the destroy side um but i love this idea of remembering yeah destruction is important but construction we need to be the world we want to have um and regarding what's going on now uh there there's just too much violence around the world and the united states has always been involved in it and it's it has roots in colonialism people taking control of other people and kind of like the 60s there's a lot of people around the world right now saying hey we don't want to be treated the way we're being treated because of our skin color or because we're poor and it frankly it seems to me that poverty is a form gandhi called it a form of economic violence it's created there seems to be enough food and water on the planet for everyone what's alarming is seeing images of children in central america india africa maybe even some in the united states who who don't have enough money for shoes and they are holding a gun and so i think by and even police violence um i include in that i think these are real problems that need to be addressed and um i don't really like either of the two main people running for us president um which is usually the case i think i don't think there's been a point in my adult life where i've really wanted one of the two main people it's a problem where we don't have a plethora of choices we're supposedly a democracy which uh i where i don't think we have a democratic culture um i'm so disappointed if, given the given the choice that we do have if you if you do vote um do you see a a pathway there yeah i mean if if i'm going to vote i will vote or, um, well, I'm actually still thinking about it. I, I definitely won't vote for the guy who used to be president. He should not have been allowed to be president as soon as he was comparing his penis size to other people when he was campaigning. And when the tape was released that he said, I can sexually assault this woman and get away with it. And when he said I could kill someone downtown New York, this is very long. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's disqualified. So, yeah, so he's that. he's out of it. Um, Kamala Harris, wow. I, but when she says I want to make sure the United States remains the most lethal military on the planet, that sounds like oh, everyone else who's been in charge of the United States. And unfortunately, people like Cornell West and Jill Stein, they're not going to win. So the argument is uh, you're throwing away your vote. Or you're Anderson, supporting the man that you just described as basically an immoral idiot. Yeah. Uh, I was just at a reading group with my anarchist friends who all agreed they're not going to participate in this uh, election or or any U.S. election, the the guy who wrote the foreword to my book, Clee Banali, uh -huh. he was in a Navajo punk band called Blackfire, and he wrote an essay about how voting in the United States is uh, continuing colonialism, um, and you can't get out of colonialism in the United States by voting it out. You need to do it by creating new communities. Um, anarchist 
methods of mutual aid and respect and cooperation. So all of these folks I was talking to, they're not going to participate because it's participating in their own oppression, um, which I, I actually believe uh, that as well. Um, we don't have a democratic culture and it's pretty much a farce, the voting mechanism. Um, so, but I do want uh, that guy not to be president. Yeah, well, there's a little bit of a twist there in there. Um, of course, you live in California, so you have the luxury of uh, making whatever choice you want and, and you know that you're state is going to basically uh, vote for Harris. Um, yeah, I, well, we can disagree about some of that and maybe talk about it <laughs> uh, further. Um, I get, I get, I was going to ask you, given especially what you said at the very beginning about your family and, and your early youth uh, trip to Israel, uh, but I get the impression that you have kind of really crossed some boundaries there in regarding the what I don't know if you're familiar with the film Israelism, but you know that trip that you went on and a lot of your early either what you call education or indoctrination that because you're Jewish you have to be totally loyal and supportive of whatever Israel's doing that you've you've made some pretty big change there and. And uh, what what we maybe would agree is genocide going on by Israel um, is something you feel like you're committed to trying to support the end of and uh, giving Palestinians the kind of justice that they deserve after all these years. <clears throat> but let me yeah. ask maybe one one more question. If you want to say anything about that, that's Gaza and what's going on there, now Lebanon, now the, in the West Bank. Yeah, it's terrible what's going on. And I, I mean, through all of my activism and journalism, I felt really clear. I don't want to live in a world where I'm afraid that people are going to bomb me or kidnap me or... Uh, build a wall around where I live and control when I come and go. So I, I don't like the idea of Hamas attacking Israel and killing people and kidnapping people. And I don't like the idea of Israel. Israel has now killed almost 50,000 people, I think, in Gaza and forced people to move all down to one area in the south. There's nowhere for them to go. They can't leave. Um, is it and, something that, that, that is particularly meaningful to you and hurtful to you because of your Jewish background? It's, I'd say it's complicated. Um, if I was Palestinian, I would be, I think, feeling more pain about it and, and connection to the Palestinian people. But as someone who is observing it, I don't want that happening to Palestinian people or anyone. What's a little, I think what's been hard to reconcile for Jewish people is Somehow, I think the word Zionism has been really interesting in the in the protests, in the language against Israel. Um, I was raised to believe that Zionism was the movement of Jewish people after the Holocaust to create a safe place for Jews to live. So that's that sounds fine. What's problematic is that the place they chose, and apparently they were looking at a bunch of different locations on planet Earth, even really far away like Madagascar. Um, but the place they chose was inhabited in 1948 by Palestinian people. My parents and their generation, when I talked to them about this history, which we did not learn, 
when I was bar mitzvahed and I went to Israel, I did not know that there was, you know, something of an ethnic cleansing or holocaust of Palestinians by Jewish people to create Israel. What I had been taught was that, here we go again, Jewish people are just trying to be safe and they create this safe place and all of a sudden they're attacked for no reason from the outside by the Arabs. It's because they um, hate us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My parents' um, way of dealing with this, their belief was the the problem here was not Israel being created on top of Palestine. It was that the Arab nations around that area, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, that they didn't take the Palestinians who were forced right. to move. That's who's at fault. This is really bizarre. Um, and I, I have to say, too, I mean, it reminds me that when I traveled widely for the first time um, in 1986, I put a backpack on and I ended up traveling um, across Europe and hitchhiked across the Sahara. And I was in Africa for six months. And then I lived in Australia for a year. When I'm talking to people, especially in Germany, about the Jewish Holocaust, and that was in 1987, people who were my age, they're saying, hey, we're, we're trying to cope with our history here of our parents and our parents' parents being involved in this Nazi period, you should go home because your country has not even started talking about the genocide that happened where you're from. Yeah. And, you know, unlike the Jewish Holocaust of the Nazi period where six million Jews were killed and we're all taught about six million, I think still no one very few people in the United States have an awareness of how many native people were here anyway when white people arrived and how many people were killed. And it's it's quite a lot more, actually, than six million. Um, so it's important to recognize our involvement and continuing privilege from genocide and uh, what's preposterous to me is growing up Jewish and the mantra we all heard was never again. Mm -hmm. And I believe that to mean never again a genocide for anyone. Mm -hmm. But right. apparently a lot of Jewish people meant never again for Jewish people. Exactly. But, but if it comes up that we need to obliterate some other people... Yeah. We're going to do that. My yeah. my personal view, too, is that a lot of things in the world happen because a lot of different groups come together and agree to do it, but they might have very disparate points of view and very different goals, actually. So I, I relate to the Jewish people in 1947 who, who are saying, we can't have another Holocaust. We need somewhere safe for Jewish people. But I, the United States government was not in that group. In fact, the United States government was, um, there were people in US government and corporations who were advising Adolf Hitler on how best to commit this genocide against Jewish people. There were um, gatherings in New York City of Nazis Mm -hmm. um, and New York police protecting them against Jewish protesters. So I think my my view is that the U.S. government wanted uh, a power place in the Middle East, and Israel has become that. It's, in essence, a U.S. military base in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and where resources and power can be controlled and has nothing to do with yeah. making sure there's a safe place for Jewish people. Basically, I see you've you've come quite a long way since you went there in 1979. Yeah. Uh, 
One more question, John. Uh, this is fascinating. Um, with all your interests, and this is a kind of a personal question for me as well, uh, and people that I know ask me this all the time, with all your different interests, you must get inundated with emails and requests and, and uh, actions that are taking place all over the place. How do you decide, what is it that, that uh, allows you to have a focus for your attention and your energy? How do you prioritize on any given day what you're going to do <laughs> out of all of this? And, and still have a life where you enjoy music and, and your family, you have a son, you have a wife. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? In 25 words or less. No, just kidding, but... Uh, yeah. well. No, I know it's it seems impossible, doesn't it, when you think about it? There's so much input all the time, and now... Maybe that's devices. the answer. Maybe we shouldn't think about it. We just Well, just also, I mean, I, I have to say I've done some kind of weird things when i i i got my i i basically don't have a cell phone um i my wife actually bought me a cell phone a year ago and we went on a trip uh it was my book tour in europe for punk revolution and it was handy to have the cell phone <laughs> but i actually call my cell phone a camera because that's what i use it for it's a really it's a really good camera I yeah. can't believe how good the cameras are now. Yeah. A video, still photos, and it happens to have a phone on it. I, that's amazing to me. So I don't carry around a computer in my pocket that's alerting me to things. I do not do that. I'm on my laptop when I am at home and I choose to open it and answer emails. And I I send and receive a lot of emails every day, but then I close it. I, you know, when you're asking me this, Alan, I, one thing I think of is having, I'm, I'm pretty disciplined with my time and I, and I leave spaces of time for doing nothing and I leave spaces of time for meditation, which often is outdoors in nature. And for me, being in nature is really important. I, usually go for an hour long hike in the forest or at the ocean every day, which is partly productive mentally. I, I'm editing things uh, because that's just what happens and it's wonderful. Sometimes when I'm typing too much, I'm thinking, I just, I need to play the piano. I don't wanna use words. I wanna just make sound. And for me, the piano is really an emotion machine. I am expressing my inner stories and thoughts and feelings through sound. And it's really satisfying and fun. And even more if other people are there or dancing to it or listening to it and having also an experience that's cathartic and beautiful. So, and another thing is having goals like I know that I'm going to interview, um, let's say I, I interviewed Daniel Ellsberg um, a couple times. If I was, uh, he's now passed away, but if I was going to be doing an interview with him tomorrow, I'd be preparing for it today um, because I, I don't want, I, I want to be ready and I want to have intelligent questions. So preparing for things that fulfill my goals uh, is sort of how I shape my day. I've also been the stay-at-home dad for my son. He's now 17, so he's off and about quite a bit now, more than when he was five, six, seven years old. But I've done a lot of cooking and cleaning and driving around and uh, drop-offs and pickups and basketball games and baseball games and um so i think underlying all of it i I'm, I'm pretty disciplined with my time but in a gentle way yeah uh, thank you and uh thank you for allocating this amount of time that we've had today i've enjoyed very much uh 
getting to know you a little bit better and uh, and our conversation, and I hope other people will as well. So thanks again, folks. Uh, you can find this at uh, Crossing the Boundary. Uh, my website's crossingtheboundary.org, and I will post information about how to be in contact with and learn more about John and all his work uh, when you wherever that is, below the YouTube and podcast screen. All right, signing off.